read this. Mathematical diseases in climate models and how to cure them. And I don't have the slightest idea what these two guys are talking about now. <laughs> and when I asked them, they said, ah, just tell them people, um, it's about next generation climate models and how to build them. Which is cool. Throw that on Twitter. <laughs> and please welcome Ali Ramadan and Valentin Khouavi. Cool. Can you guys hear us? Is this okay? Stand back. Oh, I'll stand back a little bit. Okay, cool. Thank you. So if you guys saw the last talk by Carla Labyrinth, or Carl Labyrinth or something, so we're, we're kind of expanding on her talk a little bit. So she talked a lot about kind of uncertainties, uncertainties in climate models. Um, and one point that she did make was that most of the uncertainty actually comes from humans, but there's a really huge uncertainty that also comes from comes from the models. So we're talking more about the model uncertainties, which is kind of uncertainties because of unknown or missing physics, um, kind of how to cure them. So this will be kind of a weird talk. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the climate modeling part, um, and then kind of how to cure them involves using new programming languages, and that's where Valentin will we'll talk about Julia. So we'll kind of just start with maybe just giving kind of an idea of why it's so hard to to model the climate. So if you've maybe you've seen images like this a lot, where it's like a um, it's a satellite image uh, basically of clouds. It's used for like weather forecasting, um, but you can all immediately see there's lots of you know lots of really small clouds. Um, so basically, if you want to build the climate model, you got to be able to resolve all the physics in these clouds. Um, so you can actually zoom in a lot. Um, so the, the clouds look pretty big over here, but if you zoom in on kind of Central America, then you see even smaller clouds. Um, and if you zoom in even more, so say you zoom in on the Yucatan Peninsula, um, then you can see the clouds are really, really small. So you know they're like maybe five smaller kilometers. Some some of the clouds are you know 100 meters or something. Um, and as the last talk kind of suggested, most climate models are they resolve things of you know up to 50 kilometers. Um, so anything smaller than 50 kilometers, the climate model can't really see. So you have to kind of take that. Um, and it kind of has to account for that because clouds are important. If you have more clouds, um, then that reflects some of the heat out. So maybe you cool, but it also traps more of the heat in. So maybe you warm. Um, and if you have more clouds, maybe you warm more. But if you have less clouds, maybe you um, warm even more. So it's kind of unsure. We, we actually don't know um, if clouds will make the climate warmer or if they'll make the climate cooler. Um, so it's important for your climate model to kind of resolve um, or see these little clouds. Um, so kind of where the mathematical disease comes in is that you don't, we don't know what equation to solve. We don't know exactly what physics um, to solve to see, to kind of resolve the effect of these little clouds. Um, so it's kind of the, the mathematical disease. We don't know how to do it, so you, instead you use a, um, well, it's called a parameterization, which is the mathematical disease. So in the atmosphere, the big mathematical disease is clouds. Um, but if you look at the ocean, you kind of get a similar, um, you have also similar mathematical diseases. So if you, for example, this is model output. We don't have good um, satellite imagery of the oceans. Um, so if you, if you look at, for example, model output from an ocean model, a high resolution ocean model, um, here it's kind of centered on the Pacific. So you can kind of see Japan um, and China um, and the white kind of lines. Those are streamlines or the, the lines tell you where the water is going. Um, so you can see a lot of kind of straight lines. You see this Kuroshio current off of Japan, but you see lots of circles. So the circles are these eddies, and they're kind of the turbulence of the ocean. They move, they kind of stir and mix and transport a lot of um, salt or heat or carbon or nutrients or you know marine life or anything. Um, it's the main way the ocean kind of moves heat from the equator to the pole. Um, kind of stirs things around. So they're really important for kind of how carbon moves in the ocean, for how the ocean heats up. Um, and here they look pretty big, but again, you can zoom in and you'll see lots of small scale structures. So we're gonna switch to a different model output um, and different colors. So here it's kind of the same area. So you see Japan in the top left, um, but what's being plotted is um, vorticity, so you don't have to know what that is. Um, it's kind of a measure of how much the fluid or the water is spinning. Um, but the point is that you have lots of structures. So um, there's lots of you know big circles, but there are also lots of really little circles. Um, and again, your climate model can only see something up to like 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers. Um, but as you can see here, there's lots of stuff that's much smaller 
than 100 kilometers. So if you superimpose kind of this, this grid, maybe that's your climate model grid. Um, and you know, basically for the climate model, every one of these boxes is like one number. Um, so you can't really see anything smaller than that. But there's you know, important dynamics in physics that happens at like 10 kilometers, which is a lot smaller than what the climate model can see. Um, and there's even important physics that happens at like 100 meters or 200 meters. Um, so if you want, if you want to know what the, you know, what the climate will look like, you need to, you need to know about the physics that happens at 200 meters. Um, so to give an example of some of the physics that happens at 10 kilometers, here's kind of a, a little animation where um, this kind of explains why you get all these eddies or all the circles in the ocean. So a lot of times you have, say, hot water, say, in the north. So the hot water here is all in um, orange or yellow. And you have a lot of cold water. So the cold water is in the south, and it's purple. Um, and then once, this, once you add rotation, um, you, you end up with these eddies because what the hot water wants to do, the hot water is lighter. It's less dense. So it actually wants to go on top of the cold water. So you usually have cold at the bottom, hot at the top. Um, so you have heavy at the bottom or light at the top. Um, so when you add, without rotation, the hot water will kind of just go on top of the cold water. But when you have rotation, um, you end up, it kind of wants to tip over, but it's also rotating. So you kind of get this beautiful swirling patterns. Um, these are kind of the same um, circular eddies that you see in the real ocean. Um, but this, this model here is like 250 kilometers by 500 kilometers, and it's like one kilometer deep. Um, so you need a lot of resolution to be able to, to resolve this stuff, but not, you know, your climate model doesn't have that much resolution. So um, some of the features here, like the sharp fronts between the cold and the hot water, your climate model might not see that. Um, so maybe if you, if you don't resolve this properly, you get the mixing rate wrong, or maybe the, the ocean is the wrong temperature or something. So it's kind of important to, to resolve this stuff. Um, another one, the, the, the color scheme here is really bad. <laughs> I'm sorry, but... <clears throat> Another one, for example, is here everything's on a 100 meter. Um, so it's a cube of 100 meters on each side. Um, and you're starting with 20 degrees uh, Celsius water at the top. You have 19 degrees Celsius water at the bottom initially. Um, so it's kind of your, as you go deeper in the ocean, the water gets colder. Um, and then if you can imagine in the ocean kind of at night, uh, it's kind of cold. So the top is being cooled and you end up with cold water at the top, and the cold water wants to be at the bottom, so it ends up sinking and you get all this convection going on. Um, so this is happening in a lot of places in the ocean. You get a lot of mixing at the top. Um, you get this kind of layer at the top of the ocean that's kind of constant color, constant temperature. Um, so this mixed layer is important for the ocean. So knowing how deep that mixed layer is and knowing how much of the water is being mixed is also important for, for climate, but as you can imagine, you know, it, this happens on very small scales, so your climate model has to know something about what's happening at this scale. Um, so th this isn't, I guess, the, the mathematical diseases in the ocean is the climate model cannot see this, so it has to do something else that's maybe unphysical to, to resolve this stuff, and that's the mathematical disease, I guess. Um, and aside from the ocean and the atmosphere, you, you, know, you also have the same problem with sea ice. Um, so this is kind of just a satellite picture of where sea ice is forming off the coast of Antarctica. So you get winds that kind of come off the continent and they're kind of blowing all the, the ice that's being formed away. So you get all these little lines and streaks and they kind of merge into sea ice. But this whole picture is like 20 kilometers. So the climate model doesn't see this, but somehow it has to represent all the physics. Um, and you have kind of similar um, things happening with soil moisture, land, and um, dynamic vegetation. Um, Aerosols. So the, you know the, these are kind of three um, pic, you know, places with pretty pictures. But um, say if you look at the atmosphere, so it's not just clouds. You also have um, aerosols, um, which are like little particles or sulfates um, that are important for kind of cloud formation and maybe atmospheric chemistry. Um, but again, we don't fully understand the physics of these aerosols. So again, you have to kind of parameterize them. Um, and same thing with kind of convection. So you, you know, maybe your climate model doesn't resolve all the very deep convection in the atmosphere. So it, has to, it also has to parameterize that. So I guess you have you, many kind of mathematical diseases in the atmosphere. So I'm not expecting you to understand everything in this, in this picture. But the idea is the atmosphere is complicated. There's no way a climate model is going to kind of you know, figure all this out by itself. Um, and again, you could, you could do something similar for the ocean. Um, so we kind of just showed animations for like two little parts of these, but the point is, you know, the ocean is not kind of just a bucket of water standing there. So there's lots of 
stuff happening deep inside the ocean, and some of it we think is important for climate, some of it we don't know, some might not be important. Um, but again, a lot of this happens on like very small um, spatial scales, so we don't know, or the climate model can't always resolve all this stuff. Um, and again, same thing with kind of sea ice, lots of small scale stuff is important for sea ice, and I think one person asked about kind of tipping points, and there's kind of two with like sea ice that are pretty important. One of them is this, um, sea ice albedo feedback, so if you have sea ice that melts, now you have more ocean, um, and the ocean can absorb more heat, but now the earth is warmer, so it melts more sea ice. So as soon as you kind of start melting sea ice, maybe you melt even more sea ice, and eventually you reach an earth with no sea ice. Um, so th there's kind of research into that stuff going on, but that's a possible tipping point. Um, another one is this kind of marine ice sheet stability, instability at the bottom of the ice shelf. So if you start melting water, or if you start melting ice from the bottom of the ice shelf, um, then you create kind of a larger area for more ice to melt. So maybe once you start melting and increasing sea level, you just keep melting more and more and increasing sea level even more. Um, but again, it's kind of hard to quantify these things on like 50 or 100 year time scales because um, it all happens on like very small scales. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the point is there's lots of these kind of parameterizations or mathematical diseases um, and once you start adding them all up, um, you end up with lots and lots of <laughs> kind of parameters. So the, in, in, this is a really boring table, um, but the point is, so this is like one parameterization for like vertical mixing in the ocean. It's basically the process that I showed the rainbow color movie about, so say a climate model for that, um, trying to kind of parameterize that physics might have like 20 parameters and you know, some of them are crazy, like I don't know, a surface layer fraction of like 0 0.1 or something. Um, and usually they keep the same constants for all these values. Usually it's like someone in like 1994 came up with these 20 numbers and now we all use the same 20 numbers. Um, but you know, maybe they're different in like the Pacific or the Atlantic or like maybe they're different when it's summer and winter. Um, and the problem is there's many of these parameterizations. So you know, here's like 20 parameters, but then you have a lot more for clouds, you have a lot more for sea ice and you add them all up, suddenly you have like 100, you know, maybe up to 1,000 kind of tunable parameters. Um, kind of going back to this plot that was showed at the last talk, um, you can see kind of the, all the mo models kind of agree really well from like 1850 to 2000 because they're all kind of being, um, they all have different kind of parameters but they all get kind of tuned or like optimized so they get the 20th century correct, so they get the black line correct. Um, but then when you run them forward, so you run them to like 2300, they all are slightly different so they all start producing different physics and suddenly you get a huge like red band. Um, so that's saying you have lots of model uncertainty. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know, some people might say like, oh, this like tuning process, this like optimization, it's like not very scientific. Um, they'd be kind of right. It's kind of like, in the past, it's kind of like the best we've, we've, we've had. Um, but I think, you know, we should be able to do a little bit better, better than that. Um, so just to give you an idea, you know, some people would say, you know, why don't you just, you know most of the physics, why don't you just, you know, resolve all the physics you know. Um, but say if you want to do like a direct numerical simulation, um, so that's basically saying you want to resolve all the motions in the ocean and the atmosphere, you basically need to resolve things down to like one millimeter. So if you have like a grid spacing of one millimeter um, and you consider the volume of the ocean and the atmosphere, you basically say you need like oh, 10 to the 28 grid points. You know, that's like, imagine putting cubes of like one millimeter everywhere in the ocean and atmosphere, that's how many grid points you would need. Um, so unfortunately, you could do that, but there's not enough computer power or storage space in the world to do that. So you're kind of stuck doing something a bit coarser. Um, usually, most climate models use like 10 to the 8 grid points, so that's you know 10 to the 20 too little. Um, and of course, you don't want to just run a big climate model once. You know, you need to run them for very long times. So usually, like you run them for a thousand years or 10,000 years, um, and you want to run many of them because you want to collect statistics. Um, so generally you don't run at the highest resolution possible, you run kind of at a lower resolution so you can run many, many models. So because you can only use so much resolution, it seems that parameterizations or these kind of mathematical diseases, you have to live with them, you gotta use them. Um, but at least one idea is, you know, instead of using numbers that somebody came up with in 1994, you might as well try to figure, you know, better numbers or maybe, you know, if the numbers are kind of different in different places, you should find that out. So one thing you could do or one thing we are trying to do is um, get the parameterizations to kind of 
um, agree with like basic physics or agree with observations. So we have lots of observations um, and you can, we can run kind of high resolution simulations to resolve a lot of the physics and then make sure when you put the parameterization in the climate model, it actually gives you the right numbers according to basic physics or observations. Um, but sometimes that might mean, you know, um, different numbers in the Atlantic and the Pacific or different numbers for the winter and the summer. Um, and you have to run many high resolution simulations to get enough data to, to do this. But in the, you know, these days I think we have enough computer power to do that. Um, so to, to kind of do all these high resolution simulations, we ended up building a new kind of ocean model um, that we run on GPUs because GPUs are all faster for giving us um, these results so that we ended up, usually most climate modeling is done in, in Fortran. We decided to go with, with Julia um, for a number of reasons which I'll talk about. Um, but the, the left figure is kind of that mixed layer or boundary layer turbulence kind of movie, but instead of the rainbow color map, now it's using a more reasonable color map so it looks like the ocean. Um, the right is that old movie. Um, so we're just generating tons and tons of data from uh, using simulations like this and then hopefully we can get enough data and like figure out a way to train the parameterizations. Um, but it's kind of a work in progress. Um, so a different idea um, that might be more popular here, I don't know, is um, uh, instead of kind of using the existing parameterizations, you could say, okay, well now you have tons and tons of data, maybe you just throw in like a neural network into, into the differential equations. Um, basically you put in the physics you know and then the neural network is responsible for the physics you don't know. Um, so for example, uh, you know, most people here might not, I, don't, I also don't want to talk about differential equations because that would take a long time. So just imagine that the equation in the middle is kind of what the climate model needs to solve and the question marks are kind of physics we don't know. So we, we don't know what to put there. Um, but maybe you could put in a neural network. Um, so number one uh, is kind of like a, a possible parameterization or a possible way you could try to parameterize the missing physics where the neural network is kind of responsible for everything. We find that doesn't work as well. Um, so instead maybe you tell it some of the physics. Um, so maybe you tell it about Q which is like the heating or cooling at the surface. Um, and then it's kind of responsible for resolving the other stuff. But it's still a work in progress. Um, because the, the blue is kind of supposed to be your data, the orange is supposed to be the neural, they don't agree. Um, so it's still a work in progress, but hopefully we'll be able to do a bit better. So this is kind of stuff that's like a week or two old. Um, but to kind of reach a conclusion, at least for my half of the talk, um, so the reason um, I personally like Julia as a climate modeler um, is we were able to kind of build a, a, an ocean model from scratch, basically in less than a year. Um, and one of the nice things was that the user interface or kind of the, the scripting and the model backend is all in one language, whereas in the past, you used to usually you write the high level in like Python and maybe the backend is in like Fortran or C. Um, and we find, you know, when we use Julia, it's just as fast as our legacy model, which was written in Fortran. Um, and one of the nicest things was that basically you're able to write code once um, and using, there's a native GPU compiler. So basically you write your code once, single code base, and you go to CPUs and GPUs. Um, so you don't have to write two different code bases. Um, and yeah, we find generally because it's a high level language where we're kind of more productive, we can give a more powerful user API. Um, and Julia kind of has a nice multiple dispatch um, backend so that we find that makes it easy for like users to kind of extend the model or hack the model. Um, and there's, some people would say the Julia community is pretty small, but we find there's a pretty big kind of Julia community interest in scientific computing. So we found kind of all the packages we need are pretty much available. Um, so with that, I'll kind of conclude my half by saying there's most of the uncertainty in climate modeling basically comes from humans because we don't know what humans will do. Um, but there's a huge model uncertainty basically because of physics we don't understand or physics the climate model cannot see. Um, you can't resolve every cloud, you know, every wave in the ocean. So you gotta, you gotta figure out a way to account for them. Um, so that's what our parameterization does. Um, and we're trying to kind of use a lot of computing power to kind of make sure we train or um, come up with good parameterizations instead of kind of tuning the model at the end. Um, and we're hoping this will lead to better climate predictions. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, but at least, you know, even if it doesn't, hopefully we can say we got rid of the model tuning problem. Um, and hopefully we can make, um, we find it that software development for climate modeling is easier than if we did it in, in Fortran. Oh, so I will say, this is kind of an advertisement, but I'm looking to, to bike around Germany for a week and apparently you can't take the next bike out of Leipzig. So if anyone is looking to sell their bicycle or wants to make some cash, you know, I'm looking to rent a bicycle. Um, so yeah, if you have one, come talk to me, please. Thank you, Danke.
So, um, one big question for me always is, how can we as technologists help, right? I think most of us in this room are fairly decent with computers. Um, the internet is not necessarily Neuland for us. Um, but how do we use that knowledge to actually impact real change? And if you haven't, there's a fantastic article, uh, worrytream.com slash climate change, which lists like all the possible, or not all the possible, but a lot, a lot of good ideas uh, to, to think about and go like, okay, do my skills apply in that area? Well, I'm a computer scientist. I do programming language research. So um, how do my skills really apply to climate change? How can I help? And one of the things um, that took me in this article was how, and one of the realization and why I do my work is that the tools that we have built for scientists and engineers, they are rather poor. Um, computer scientists like myself have focused a lot on making programming easier, more accessible, um, but we ne don't necessarily have kept the scientific community uh, as a target audience. And then you get into this position where models are written in a language, Photon 70. Photon is a rather nice language, but it's still not one that is easily picked up and uh, where you will find enthusiasm in younger students for using it. So I work on Julia. Um, and my goal is basically to make a scientific computing easier, more accessible, and make it easier to access the uh, huge computing powers we have available to do uh, climate modeling. Um, ideas, if you are interested in this space, is you don't need to work on Julia necessarily, but you can think about maybe I'm um, uh, to look at modeling for physical systems, uh, modeling, like one of the questions is, can we model um, air conditioning units more uh, precisely, get them more efficient, or any other technical system? How do we get better efficiency, but we need better tools to do that? So uh, the uh, language down here as an example is um, Modelica. There's a project right now, Modia, that is trying to see how we can push the boundary there. The language up here is uh, Fortran. You might have seen a little bit of that in the talk beforehand. And it's most often used to, to do climate science. So why programming languages? Why do I think that my time is best spent to actually work on programming languages and um, do that in order to help people? Well, Wittgenstein once said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. What I can express is what I think about. And I think people who are multilingual know that, that sometimes it's easier to think for them about certain things in one language than it is in the other one. Um, but language is about communication. It's about communication with scientists, but it's also about communication with the computer. And too often programming language falls into that uh, trap where it's about, oh, I want to express my one particular problem, or I want to express uh, my problem very well for the compiler, for the computer. I want to talk to the machine. But we've, I found that uh, programming languages are a very good tool to talk to other scientists, to talk in a community, and to actually collaborate. And so the project that Ali and I are both part of has, I think, 30-ish? I don't know, the numbers are this is big. It's a big group of uh, climate scientist modelers, and we have a couple of numerical scientists, computer scientists, um, and engineers, and we are all working the same language, being able to collaborate and actually work on the same code, instead of me working on some low-level implementation and uh, Ali telling me what to write. And that wouldn't be really, really efficient. Um, so yes, my goal is to make research easier. Do we really need a yet another high-level language? That is a question I often get. It's like, why Julia and not, why are you not spending your time and effort doing this for Python? Well, so this is um, as a small example. This is Julia code. It looks rather readable, I find. Um, it doesn't use uh, sem uh, semantic white space. You may like that or not. Um, it has all the typical features that you would expect from a high-level dynamic language. Um, it is uh, using the MIT license. It has a built-in package manager. It's very good for interactive development. But it has a couple of unusual ones. And those matter. You need, if you want to simulate a climate model, you need to get top performance on a supercomputer. Otherwise, you won't get an answer in the time that it matters. Um, Julia uses uh, uh, just-in-time, ahead-of-time compilation. 
Um, the other great feature is that Julia is written in Julia, so I can just look at implementations. I can dive and dive and dive deeper into somebody's code and don't have a comprehension barrier. If, I, if you ever have spent some time and tried to figure out how Python sums numbers under the hood to make it reasonably fast, good luck. It's hard. It's written in C, and there is a lot of barriers in order to understand what's actually going on. Then reflection and metaprogramming, you can do a lot of fun stuff, um, which we're going to talk about. And then the very big one for me is that you have native GPU code generation support. So you can actually take Julia code and run it on the GPU. You're not relying on libraries. Because libraries only are, can express the things that was, were written in them. So early on uh, last December, I think, we met up for the climate science project. And after deciding on using Julia for the entire project, um, they were like, we are happy with the performance, but we have a problem. We have to duplicate our code for GPUs and CPUs. And I'm like, what, really? That can't be. I mean, I designed the damn thing. It should be working. Well, what they had at that point was basically always a copy of two functions, where one side of it was writing the GPU, uh, CPU code, and the other side was implementing the uh, GPU code. And really, there were only a couple of GPU-specific parts in there. And if anybody has ever written GPU code, it's this pesky um, which index am I calculation. Whereas the for loop on the CPU just looks quite natural. And I was like, well, see, come on. What we can do is we can just write a kernel. So uh, um, we take the body of the for loop, extract it into a new function, add a little bit of sugar and magic, um, to uh, call GPU kernels and CPU functions, and then we're done. Problem solved. Well, the code roughly would look, uh, look like this, and actually this, uh, you can copy and paste this, and it should work. Um, and so you have two functions. One of them launches, a, you extract your kernel, then you write a function that takes another function and runs that function in a for loop, or it launches that function on um, the GPU. And then you have this little GPU snippet. This is the only bit that is executed on the GPU, which calculates the index and then calls the function f with its index argument. I'm like, I'm done here. My, my, my contribution to this project is done. Um, well, they came back to me and were like, no, this is not good enough. And I was like, why? Well, the issue is they needed kernel fusion. So that's the process of taking two functions and merging them together. And I'm like, okay, fine. Um, why do they need that? Because in, if you want to be write average efficient GPU code, you need to be really concerned about the numbers of global memory loads and stores. Um, if you have too many of them or if they are irregular, you lose a lot of performance. And we need good performance, otherwise we can't simulate uh, to the resolution early ones. Um, they also actually wanted to take uh, use GPU functionality and low-level control. So they wanted to look at their kernels and use shared memory constructs. They wanted to do uh, precise working, minimizing the number of registers used. And they really cared about low-level performance. And they were like, well, we can't do this with the abstraction you gave us um, because it builds up too many barriers. And I could have given the, I feel more typical computer science answer, which would have been, okay, give me two years and I will come back to you, and there's the perfect solution, um, which is like a cloud console in the sky. Um, I write your bespoke language that does exactly what you need to do, and at the end, we have a domain-specific language for climate simulation that will do finite volume and discontinuous clerking and everything you want, and I will have a PhD. Great, fantastic. Well, we don't have the time. The whole climate science project that we are on has a rather accelerated timeline. Um, because the philanthropists that are funding that research are, well, if you can't give us better answer anytime soon, it won't matter anymore. So I sat down and was like, okay, I, I need a botch. I need something that has minimal effort, quick delivery. It, I need to be able to fix it if I get it wrong the first time around, and I did. Um, it needs to be hackable. My collaborators need to understand it and actually be able to change it. And it needs to be happened yesterday. Well, Julia is good at these kind of hacks. And as I've learned, 
you can actually let them grow into bespoke uh, solutions and have better um, abstractions after the fact um, so that, you're, that you can actually do the fancy computer science tricks that I really wanted to do. Um, the project is called GPUify Loops because I couldn't come up with a worse name. Um, and nobody else could, so we stuck with it. Um, it's a macro based, and so Julia, um, you can write syntax macros that transform, uh, that transform the written statements into some other statements. So you can insert code or remove code if you want to. Um, it right now targets CPUs and GPUs, and we are talking about um, how do we get multi threaded into the story, how do we target more on different GPUs. Um, there are other projects that are very similar. So there's Ocker, which is uh, where a lot of these ideas are coming, coming from, and OpenACC um, in C++ does something very similar. But basically, you write a for loop, you write an at loop in front of it, which is a magic macro that takes a transformation, and you have two index statements. And now you just say, I want to launch it on a GPU, and it magically does the job. Great, fantastic. So let's peek under the hood. The entire implementation of the macro at loop without um, the error checking um, that didn't fit on the screen uh, is a couple of lines. So everything is here. Um, and basically, I'm just manipulating the for loop so that on the GPU, it only iterates one iteration per index, and on the uh, CPU, it iterates all of the indices because a CPU is single-threaded and a GPU is many, many multi-threaded cores. Um, there's a little bit of magic hidden in the isDevice function because how do I know where I'm running? And if you're curious how to do that, and we can talk after, afterwards. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's a very simple, um, straightforward transformation. It's written in Julia. It's a Julia function. Um, and yeah. So, you don't need to understand the code here. I just wanted to show how quick it can be to write uh, something like this. Um, sh if you know anything about GPU programming at all, there should be a little voice in the, head of, uh, in the back of your head that is like, wait a second. How can you run a dynamic programming language on a GPU? That shouldn't be possible. Well, Julia can run on the GPU because it has a lot of metaprogramming uh, facilities for support for stage programming, so I can generate code based on a specific call signature. It has introspection and reflection mechanisms that allow me to do some interesting stuff in the background. It is built upon LLVM, which is a common compiler infrastructure, and so I can actually write a staged function that will generate an LLVM specific code for my one function uh, and do, so, do that um, during compile time. Um, and it's a dynamic language that tries very hard to avoid runtime uncertainties. And this is one of the challenges if you're getting into Julia, is to understand um, that when you're writing code that has a lot of runtime uncertainties, you get relatively slow performance or as fast as Python. Um, but if you uh, work with the compiler and your white runtime uncertainties, you can get very fast code and you can run your code on the GPU. Basically, that's the uh, litmus test. If you can run your code on the GPU, you did your job well. Um, and it provides tools to understand the behavior of your code. So avoiding runtime uncertainty. It does that, and I don't have the time to go too deep into that, so there's, a, there's an actually a paper about this. It has a type system that allows you to do some sophisticated reasoning, type inference to figure out what your code is doing, Multiple dispatch is actually helping us quite a lot in making it easier to de-virtualize calls. It uses aggressive specialization and just-in-time compilation. And so just looking a little bit closer at some of these topics, um, if you want to look at the entire um, pipeline that flow, when you start, write your function and call it, what happens um, through the Julia compiler, you have tools to introspect, and all of these are on the right-hand side here, and then you have tools to interact um, on the left-hand side, where you can inject code back into the compiler. The other thing is Julia has dynamic semantics. So when you, def you can, at runtime, redefine a function, and it will call the new function. 
and uh, it uses multiple dispatch. So if I look at the um, absolute value call here, which of the 13 possible methods will it call? Um, in C++ or in other programming languages, it's called a virtual function call. So isn't Julia everything a virtual function call? No, this is um, one of the important points is when we call a function, uh, let's say we call sine of x, we look at the type of the input arguments and then we, first of all, look at which function is applicable um, to our input argument. So in this case, um, it would be the real down here because float64 is a subtype of real. So we choose the right method using dispatch and then we specialize that method um, for the signature. So the rule in multiple dispatch to remember is we're calling the most specific method, whatever specific might mean. So if you have this little example where we have um, function f, which has three different methods, um, and we have an integer argument that can be matched on x or on y, and then we have a floating point argument on y, and we call this with one comma hello, well, we will select the method that is most specific for this argument, which would be uh, the number one here. Um, on the other hand, if when we have a float six, uh, 64 in the second position, then we will call the second method. Now, what happens if I pass in an integer in the first position and a floating point in the second position? Well, you will get a runtime error because we can't make this decision what is the most specific method. So that's just something to keep in mind. Method specialization works very similarly when you call a method for the first time. Um, this method sign right now has no specializations and then I look, I call it once and Julia will insert a specialization just for float64. Before that, it could have been a float32 or float64 for this method. So Julia specializes and compiles methods on concrete call signatures instead of keeping everything dynamic or everything ambiguous. You can introspect this uh, process um, and there are several macros that are code lowered or code typed that will help you understand that process. Um, I think I don't have enough time to go into detail here, but just as a note, if you ever look at this, the percentage form means it's an assignment. So if you reference it later, um, so in line five, we will iterate on the four value. And then we can look at the type information that Julia infers out of that call. So we're calling the function Mandel with a UN32, and you can see how that information propagates through the uh, fo uh, function itself. And then if we actually do aggressive, we, we do a, a, a aggressive inlining and optimizations and devirtualization, and so in the end, we don't have calls anymore. We only have the intrinsics that Julia provides on which uh, programs are actually implemented. So this is a unsigned less than integer function. So we are using type inference as an optimization to find static or near static subprograms. It allows us to do aggressive devirtualization, inlining, constant propagation, but it raises problems of cache invalidation. So in bygone days, this used to be the case. I could define a new function G after calling G once, uh, function, a new function F after calling G once, and I would get the old result back. That's bad, that's counterintuitive, that's not dynamic. So in Julia 1.0 and uh, I think 05 and 06 already, uh, we fix that. So we're invalidating the functions um, that have dependencies on the function we just changed. That can increase the latency of your program. If you change a lot of the functions and you recall them, well, hmm, we need to do a lot of work every time. We do constant propagation. So as a very simple example, um, we try to reduce, um, we try to exploit as much information as possible, and so if you call, if you write a function f and you call the function sine with a constant value, we actually will just return you the constant, avoiding the calculation of the sine entirely, and that can be very important during um, hot calls in a, in a cycle. Um, this can sometimes go wrong, uh, or Julia can, uh, has heuristics, 
in order to decide when or, whether or not these optimizations are valuable. And so when you introspect your code, you might see um, results that are, not, uh, that are not quite what you want. So we don't know what the return value here is. It's just a tuple. We know it's a tuple, nothing else. Uh, so the heuristic decided not to specialize. But the nice thing about Julia and where we get performance for is that we can actually do for specialization and hopefully at some point we will make the compiler smart enough that these edge cases disappear. So I can use some uh, secrets um, and uh, force the specialization to happen and then I can actually infer the precise return type of my function. Another thing to know when you're coming from a traditionally object-oriented programming language is that uh, types are not extensible, extendable, so you can't inherit from uh, something like in64. You can only subtype ex abstract types. We do that because otherwise we couldn't do a lot of optimizations. Um, when, we, when we look at programs, we can't never assume that you won't add code. Right? We are dynamic programming language. At any time in the runtime of your program, you can add code. And so we don't have closed world semantics, which doesn't, doesn't allow us to say, hey, by the way, we know all possible subtypes here. You might, might add a new type later on. By saying that concrete types are not extendable, we get a lot of the performance back. So personally for me, why do I like Julia or why do I work on Julia? Um, it works like Python, it talks like Lisp and runs like Fortran, that's my five second um, sales pitch. Um, it's very hackable and extendable. I can poke at the um, internals. Um, and uh, I can bend them when I, if I need to. Um, it's built upon LVM, so in reality, for me, as a compiler writer, uh, uh, it's my favorite LVM front end. Um, I can get the LVM code that I need to actually run. But for users, that's ho hopefully not a concern if, I, if we do our job right. Um, and it has users in scientific computing, and I, in a prior life, I was doing a lot of scientific computing um, in cognitive science, writing models, um, and I care about these users because I've seen um, how hard it can be to actually make progress when the tools you have are bad. And um, my personal goal is to enable scientists and engineers to collaborate efficiently and actually make change Julia is a big project and Climber is a big project. There are many people to thank. Um, and with that, I would like to extend you an invitation if you're interested. Um, there's JuliaCon every year where we have a developer meetup. Um, last year we were about 360 people, so much smaller uh, than CCC. Um, but next year it will be in Lisbon. Um, so come join us if you're interested and if you want to meet scientists who have interesting problems and uh, are looking for solutions. Thank you. Time for questions and answers. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah, we've got microphones over there. So just jump to a microphone and ask your question so that everybody could hear them. Um, what do you mean when you say that Julia talks like Lisp? And how is this a good thing? <laughs> well, it talks like Lisp, but it doesn't look like Lisp. Uh, <laughs> I assume that's what you mean. It doesn't have that many places. But no, um, Lisp has rather powerful metaprogramming capabilities and macros, um, and so we have a lot of that. Uh, if you le read a little bit about the history of, of Lisp, the original intention was to write mLisp, which would be Lisp with a nice syntax. And I think Julia is my personal is mLisp. It has all the nice features, but it doesn't have the uh, bracket syntax. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. My question is regarding the first part of the talk. Um, you, if I understand correctly, you're simulating a deterministic system there. So there's no additional noise term or anything, right? Uh, well, <clears throat> it, if you had infinite precision, I think it would be deterministic, but I think by kind of design, turbulence itself is not deterministic. Well, it's a chaotic agree. system, but... But uh, the discretized version itself is deterministic. You don't have a Monte Carlo part where you have some noise that you would add to, which might actually be justified from the physics side, right? Uh, well, so I, I mean, we, 
if you, I think if you ran the same simulation again, you would not get, the, well, I think if you ran it on the exact same machine, you would get the same answer. So in that sense, it is deterministic. But if you ran it on a slightly different machine, like truncation error on like the 16th decimal place could give you a completely different answer. Sure. Uh, so the point I'm trying, uh, am I allowed to continue? Yes, of course. There's no one else. Stop. Well, there, there is one person else, so you can continue a few minutes if you okay, want to. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So um, the point I was trying to make is if you add noise in the sense that it's a physical system, you have noise in there, it might actually allow you to not solve a PDE or discretize a PDE but get a stochastic simulation itself which might be interesting because it often can make things easier. And also um, you mentioned neural differential equations, right? And in particular with um, physical systems, if you have uh, discontinuities, for example, the DT integral can actually be quite the problem and there is work on to just plug my colleague's work, um, controlled neural differential equations where you can actually also build in these discontinuities, which might also be interesting for you guys. Just also, maybe, sure. maybe we should talk because I don't know much about that stuff where we're kind of just starting off. Um, I think, yeah, the stuff we've been doing is maybe hopefully continuous, but um, maybe we'll hit discontinuities. I don't know. We should talk, though. Thank you. And also, the math oh, is yeah. beautiful and ha has no sickness. It's the physics that might need to change. I'm a mathematician. I had to say that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, the, the physics is ugly, trust me. Um, just to Finish. jump in quickly. Okay. We do have stickers, and I have. Uh, <laughs> and so they have cookies too. And they are in the cookie box. Um, and on, I think day four, somebody from our community is giving a Julia workshop, um, and we're trying to find up, uh, set up an assembly space, um, and hopefully that goes out as well at some point. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, also, one question for the first part of the talk. Yeah. Uh, sure. I, want, I wanted to ask uh, if it's possible or if you are using uh, dynamic resolution in your climate models where you maybe have smaller crit size uh, near the vortices and uh, larger in the areas that are not that interesting. Oh, like, like adaptive grids? Yes. So I think uh, we mostly do that in the, in the vertical. So usually in the ocean, the thing, things are interesting in, in the, you know, close to the surface, so you have more resolution there. But as you go deeper, things get less interesting, so you put less resolution there. Um, generally, I think in, in general, the arc, I, I, people have asked that before. You know, if, why do you always use constant grids? Why don't you use these adaptive grids on your global you know, models? And usually the answer I've heard, I don't know if it's very convincing. I think generally there hasn't been that much research. Um, or people who do research into adaptive grids for climate models, their funding gets cut. Um, but I, like the, the answer I've heard is that a lot of the climate, a lot of the atmosphere and ocean is turbulent. So if you, especially if you do kind of adaptive refinement, then it just kind of adapts everywhere because there's kind of turbulence everywhere. But yeah, I don't, I, I'm not, I guess for, for our simulations, we're kind of just, um, some of the numerical methods are only fast if you run it on like kind of a regular grid. So that's the reason we don't use adaptive grids for our simulations. But um, in general, adaptive grids for climate models is interesting. But I haven't heard, like it seems like you need there needs to be more research in that area. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I kind of just rented. You did, thanks. <laughs> so go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, it's just a few, a few questions about this. Uh, I think I I, I I wrapped quite a bit of legacy Fortran code in Python, and uh, my question is would uh, would, would that be a, a, a simple pass uh, converting Fortran code to Julia, preferably automatically? Do, do you have any ideas about this one? You can do it. Your Julia code will look like Fortran code. So you haven't won anything. So um, yes, as a good starting point, you can do that, absolutely. But you can also just call Fortran from Julia and then gradually move over. I generally don't want people to rewrite their code except if there's a good reason. Like starting from scratch sometimes helps. Um, it can be a good reason, or if you say the solutions, we don't have the necessary experts to, to work with the old solution anymore. Um, but in generally, if you have Fortran code, I would just say, well, call Julia from Fortran or Fortran from Julia, um, get that up to speed, and then start transitioning piece by piece where it makes sense. So any more questions? No more questions. That's an early wrap then. <laughs> Ali Ramadan and Valentin Chouhavi, thank you very much.